All right, I just went off mute. If you guys want to uh, go off mute as well, Blake. Um, hello, hello. I think we are streaming to Facebook Live. Um, can you see the comments or anything on Facebook Live? I see comments coming in. Michael's here, Ernest's here, Will is here. So people can hear us, audio video seems good. Little confirmations there. Perfect. I think if we feel like everybody's kind of getting into the room successfully and they're hearing us, whenever you're ready, Blake, I think we could start kicking things off unless we're going to give everybody one more minute or so. No, that's okay. They can join in. All okay. right. I will stop sharing my desktop and let everybody's faces appear here. So let's do that. Welcome to the Cloud Accounting Podcast for a special bonus episode. I'm Blake Oliver. I'm David Leary. We are joined today by Enrico Palmarino. He's the CEO and founder of Botkeeper, as well as Justin DeBosch, who is the technical director. Did I get that right, Justin? Yep. All right. Welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us, Enrico and Justin. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks, guys. So um, before we jump in, I just want to thank Veeam for sponsoring. And so uh, a little Veeam story. I had to pay Blake for some hosting costs. So I create my bill in QuickBooks Online. By the time I opened up the Veeam browser, the bill was already there. So I already synced it and or opened up Veeam my browser. The bill was already there and I already synced it. Because I already had uh, Blake's email address in my QuickBooks, I didn't have to do anything but hit a button that said pay Blake. So it was like on a Monday. And then on Thursday, Blake got the money in his bank account. And no, literally, literally it was, it would, I did nothing but open up the browser and click the button. I mean, the only way it'd be easier is if Veeam had a button inside of QuickBooks Online. So it's a good way to pay like business to business for sure. And I have to say from the perspective of somebody getting paid, uh, it was pretty darn easy to go in and set up my account. I think all I needed was my email address and address, um, you know, that typical information linked up to my bank account and got the notification that David had uh, paid me and got the notifications as, as it proceeded through the, the stages, which was pretty cool because normally I, I don't get notified if I'm going to get a payment, but uh, Veeam was, was good about notifying me. It notifies on both sides, right? Yep. Like I, I, I'm notified like, oh, it's been taken out of your account. Now it's been moved to Blake's account and the whole process in between. And my understanding though, because it was your first payment, it took like up to three days, but then it's a lot faster. If once this, if I pay you again the second time, it's just faster. Oh, that's great. So. Well, it's always nice when uh, we try something out that a sponsor, <laughs> let, we try out the sponsor's product and it works. Yeah. So good job, Veeam. Yeah. So if you guys want to try out Veeam as well, go to cloudaccountingpodcast.com forward slash Veeam, V-E-E-M, and you guys can try it out as well. So without further ado, welcome Enrico. Welcome, Justin. Thank you. Um, I think... We should start probably with a demo, right? And jump in. Yeah, I'd love to do it. A demo um, of Botkeeper. Yes, um, I'll let Justin take it over and put it on the screen. My, it's, uh, it's funny, my wife was um, joking with me that, you know, she's like, you're a quant major, you probably shouldn't be tweeting on uh, Facebook. You know, you're certainly not a, a PR specialist and, you know, good luck trying to do a demo of ML and AI in 120 characters. So glad that we <laughs> Opportunity. really appreciate you guys uh, uh, allowing us to do this. And um, so what, what Justin has just thrown up is uh, an example, just so you know, too, we've uh, we scrubbed out um, a bunch of like any of the PII here in this, uh, this data. Um, so uh, what Justin's showing is uh, QuickBooks um, and an uncategorized expense that has come into QuickBooks. Uh, essentially, uh, this client, you can see down below, they had previously been using AWS as their hosting provider. Um, then Justin can keep scrolling and kind of showing the you know, recurring AWS transactions. Um, Intuit would be, you know, if you create a rule, it said, you know, every time uh, something you know, purchased by Amazon or AWS is uh, hosting, you know, then certainly it would categorize it for you. But um, creating, maintaining, updating those rules can be uh, a hassle and a headache, uh, especially if products change descriptions, uh, vendors start selling new things. Um, so one of the really cool things about Botkeeper is, in this case, this client switched to uh, Google Cloud um, as their new hosting provider. And so that, that uh, transaction landed in the uncategorized expense uh, bucket. 
Um, and so imagine, you know, think about this, like, especially from uh, botkeeper stance, we process uh, millions of transactions um, for our clients every month. And there's a lot of these um, categorized transactions that are occurring. And uh, even on the rule set, we actually, for the most part, turn off uh, a lot of the rules and then just leverage our AI to actually do the mapping because we find it's uh, more consistently accurate. Um, but what will happen next is essentially this transaction gets pulled into uh, Botkeeper where um, you can imagine on this list if this was, uh, so Justin's just refreshing the screen, um, showing the transaction again, uh, getting pulled in. And you can imagine that normally in this, if we're grabbing all the transactions uh, across all the clients, there could be hundreds or thousands of transactions in this bucket that would take a decent amount of time for a human to go in and do the categorization or look up this vendor because you know GCP isn't like a super descriptive de uh, definition. Um, you might look at the memo, but there, it just takes time to click on those things, you know, do a Google search, et cetera. Um, so behind the scenes, what will start to happen, and don't click the button yet, so I'll kind of give uh, a little background first. So behind the scenes, um, Botkeeper has multiple machine learning algorithms running, um, as well as natural language processing. So what, the, what's, what essentially happens first is uh, the natural language processing looks at all the text, and it starts cleaning it up, parsing it out, um, trying to make sense of it, and then storing it. Uh, another algorithm runs that goes and searches the web for any and all information, data related to uh, this particular transaction, anything it can find, and then tries to make sense of that as well, store that uh, in the database. Another so it's doing kind of what you do as a human. You, you see some charge and the merchant name's weird, and you're like, did I charge that? So you start Googling it, and then you figure, oh yeah, I remember going to that restaurant. And so it's kind of doing that process. Correct. Like the, the whole, the, the goal is like, and that's why they call it artificial intelligence, but like really it should be thought of as augmented intelligence. It's, it's performing like an action that you would do in a similar way that you would do it. Um, and then basically assisting you to like affirm that, yes, this is what it, what I would, what I would have guessed it to be. Um, and so then another, uh, and not to get like too deep here, but another um, machine learning model runs against the client to determine the complexity level of that business. So what variety of vendors, new transactions they're processing, the quantity, et cetera. And then another one runs to actually try multiple machine learning models against this client to basically say, you know, there are, there are many different models out there. There are random forest models, there are linear regression models, there's clustering algorithms, et cetera. There's combinations of the two. So then that runs to basically try to figure out which of the models, given this, you know, client's complexity score and all the other data that we have, which model is going to most accurately or most likely the highest probability guess correctly what this thing is. And then once it's figured that out, it runs the final model to do that categorization. So go ahead and click the button. So what's going to happen in a very short period of time where all those things that I just described, and you'll notice that in uh, the category button, as soon as this you know finishes running, and this would be running against, you know, just picture on like a daily basis, this running against hundreds or thousands of transactions, it accurate, accurately guesses uh, and categorizes this thing as hosting. And then what it does is quick, if Justin goes, well, actually, so it guesses it's hosting, our humans review it to basically say, does this make sense? Um, and they can do a very like quick review because they just imagine there's a ton of transactions here, quickly review, they can quickly edit or update. So if they start updating, it's you know pulling from the chart of accounts, um, the different categorizations that this client might have. Um, they would approve it if it was correct. So in this case, it's correct, approve. And then what's gonna happen is that's gonna sync all of these transactions across all of our clients into that client's QuickBooks. So when the client logs back in, they're going to see that these, these transactions have now been properly categorized and classified accordingly. Um, and so this is like just one step of a machine doing something. Um, the next step would be, uh, or actually say like even a prelude to this, would be if you had submitted to us um, an analog like some analog data, let's say it lived on a receipt or lived on an invoice, the, the first step of the equation would actually be that OCR runs against that document. And, and it, just to kind of be clear here, Botkeeper is built in uh, various forms of technology. So we built machine learning, we built AI, 
Uh, we've built uh, robotic process automation. We've built data integrations for pushing data in and out of different systems, as you see here. Um, we've built uh, decision trees and like workflows and events to alert our own in internal staff that they should look at something or spend more time on something. And so in that analog scenario, we're using OCR to grab data off. We're using machine learning and some of these models to basically contextualize, et cetera, that data, figure out what it is. We're then, after we've figured out what it is, it's a matter of, okay, if this is an expense that's already been incurred, it's gonna get booked. If this is an expense that hasn't been incurred and say it's a bill that needs to be paid and like your, your scenario of Veeam, it would, the data would get automatically pushed into bill.com and the appropriate, because bill.com is, is one of the platforms that we leverage uh, for bill pay. We get pushed into bill.com, all the appropriate data information. It would have done a check against the vendors that were already listed in bill.com, which are synced with QBO to say, you know, even if it wasn't properly like entered the first time, the same thing that did that contextual like enrichment, just like parse it out, would say, hey, most of this vendor's name is exactly the same. And the thing that's missing or the thing that is here instead makes sense. Like ink, like period. If it didn't have that before, that's not a major change. That makes sense that this is the same vendor. And then it either updates with that, you know, the ink component and syncs across, or it leaves the vendor as is and drops the ink. And then the client in that scenario. So once that's approved, when that once that's been completed, now there's a bill basically waiting for that client and, and bill.com um, waiting to be approved and, and paid. And it's in the appropriate approval workflow because the thing that got in the appropriate approval approval workflow is a rule set that we built with the client, um, basically giving us or educating us on their business and the different rules and processes that they follow. So over so many such a dollar amount, I want it to go in this approval workflow and, and be approved by these two people, et cetera. And so that kind of like, I think quickly describes um, a few different scenarios of BotKeeper automating work. And then we ha obviously have like, you know, the machine doesn't do everything. It's not, and it's not perfect, which is why we have interfaces for our team to go in, view, correct, assess, you know, uh, affirm that it's right. And let's say, kind of the way to think about like AI and automation, automation's really, really good at automating simple, manu like manual, tedious, mundane, high volume tasks. And when it gets to a task that's complex, that's probably gonna be done by a human. But the nice thing is if that complex task over time, so this is why like, you know, how much of a client's work is automated by BotKeeper versus assisted by human? It varies from client to client, depending on what tasks that client's using for BotKeeper. So are they using us to do everything, including collection calls and emails? Well, collection calls are definitely happening by a human. But the goal of BotKeeper was to give you a, a one-stop shop to deliver the, the, the full swoop or full scope of bookkeeping services that you might need and to use as much machine, as much tech along the way to get it done as efficiently as possible. Basically making our humans that we have be superhumans. Um, so now the, the beauty is the longer you stay with BotKeeper, so even if you do give us complex tasks, if over time we can identify a pattern on those complex tasks and, and basically start to see that there is some semblance of a rule here, we can then build that rule set into BotKeeper to start performing what was previously a complicated task because we just didn't know it or see it often enough and make that an automated task moving forward. So and that's, I, that, that's I just, basically it in a nutshell. Yeah, so it's interesting that you kind of use that, that so really it's, it, Bookkeeper's a one-stop shop for a suite of possible services a bookkeeper would offer. It's not like, it's an interesting way to think about it, right? Yeah, it, it's not, it's not right. just software. Like if you, if it was just software, we'd basically be giving people like, hey, here's some code, you know, good luck, run it yourself. And, you know, it's going to do part of the bookkeeping function for you and not the rest. Whereas we, we didn't like the, the market feedback we got was, hey, our issue with among accounting firms was there's not enough good bookkeepers out there. Like I, we, there's a lack of supply in bookkeepers and an influx in demand. And it, we're having a really hard time meeting that. We're seeing a lot of attrition on the good bookkeepers that we do hire. And 
you making like if I have one bookkeeper um, and I only have 10 clients and you giving me a tool that makes that bookkeeper say more efficient but, but doesn't like actually it doesn't actually reduce cost like so that bookkeeper just doesn't have to do as much work and there might not be enough work for them to do to leverage that additional time and so kind of the, the solution we were filling was if you lose a bookkeeper you can plug bookkeeper in if you're going through a high scale mode you can plug bookkeeper in and let us augment the need for additional bookkeepers so your firm can focus on hiring you know more skilled accountants doing more advisory consulting um, critical thinking you could say i just want bookkeeper to do this part of the bookkeeping process and then I'm going to have my people do these other parts. So like maybe the complex tasks, you want to keep it in house or in your firm. Um, so it, it, it totally ranges. I mean, we've had, we have small startups that never hire a bookkeeper, use Botkeeper directly. Ideally they, they sign on to Botkeeper through one of our partners and then our partner is basically providing the bookkeeping services to them, um, by white labeling and leveraging our platform. But, uh, and then we've had, you know, large corporations or, or large accounting firms also, you know, they, you lose one or two staff that puts a lot of extra work on, you know, the staff remaining, those people get frustrated, like maybe they leave. And so they bring us in as a stopgap and then kind of incrementally use us as, as the business grows. So, so, so you did cover some questions somebody actually had is like, can I get this tech and run it on site myself? So obviously no, but really what you've kind of built here, if I'm, if I'm really paying attention correctly, is you have internal in-house bookkeepers under your roof, your roof, yep. right? And you are making them uber efficient. Yeah. So instead of having a bookkeeper that does, I think even Blake's blog post, instead of a bookkeeper that does, handles 10 clients a month or 40 clients a month, you're pushing up to what numbers, I think? Wasn't that part? Uh, I mean, it depends on the the business, right? Like you could be doing ten clients a month that are huge companies. Oh, it makes could, sense. Yeah, doing, yeah. yeah so it, it's hard to say what that is. I can say, you know, Blake and I had this convo. He was telling me with his business that, that he had hired this one person who was like a super rock star accountant that was serving fifty or sixty clients, and he knew he could never replicate that. Like it just he wasn't going to be able to easily find that again. And all of our people average fifty or sixty clients. Um, so. We, we're achieved, and and that said, we have com we have Fortune 5,000 companies that use us, right? So they've augmented probably the need for many people. So you know, take that 50 or 60, and maybe even multiply it farther because there are some very large companies doing a lot of processing. Uh, mm -hmm. with it. So, think, yeah, think of the cyborg. To your point, where we're part human, part machine. The the combination of both means it's better than just a machine, and it's better than just a human. So, so to get back to the demo aspect, um, yeah. uh, I can see how the software can dramatically speed up coding of transactions from the bank feed and how that can be superior in many, many respects. And for, for a number of clients, that's great because that's all they need is cash basis bookkeeping. But what about the situation where you really need those source documents and the bank feed is just not enough? Can you, can you show us now how that would work, like if if I, like you described in our interview, taking a snapshot or scanning an invoice, and then you guys extract the line item detail and post that properly into bill.com, for instance. Can we see that? The the challenge of seeing that is it's it pretty much like anyone else, any of the other players and the data extraction off of analog. Um, it doesn't happen instantly. Like it takes some time to extract process, run, confirm, validate. Um, he, Justin can pull up, you know, this, he could, you know, kind of run a test on the front end, but I, it, it could take two hours for it to end up because it depends on, you know, our, it depends on our team's approval schedule. Like when are they, when did they look at that transaction to affirm that it's correct? So like, we don't, we don't let, uh, I had this philosophy that less than accurate accounting is not accounting, right? So what we didn't want to do is push things that were for the most part accurate into QuickBooks. We wanted to wait until we actually had a human, you know, do at least an eye, like a once over um, validation. It helps improve um, the accuracy, you know, a little bit more and get it as high as we can possibly get it. So depending on when, when that person 
runs that approval process and cycle is going to depend on when that data gets pushed into your QuickBooks. And we try to make sure that along all the transactions we're processing, that pushing is happening at least daily, if not more. So, and what about situations that are more complex than light items even? Uh, Jan mentioned job costing. How do, you, how do you do job costing for your customers? So similar to the way uh, that a human would do job costing is we'd need to have some sort of job code. So if, there is, if the job code was communicated either on the document or in, uh, like we've seen some construction companies that use us send us like an Excel sheet with uh, information that has, you know, job codes on it or projects that are going on, or they communicate to us, like maybe they're not using like an actual code, but they're using like the physical addresses of the properties that are being worked on. It, as long as you give us data that we can map a transaction to, we can do it, but we can't, we're going to run into the same issues that a person's going to run into where if we see uh, a receipt uh, or an invoice, we have no information about it and there's a bunch of transactions on there, we're not going to know where to put those transactions any more than the best person would. So the, the, the algorithm is not then assigning expenses to job codes. That's a human is referencing some sort of document and then coding up the transactions by job? No, uh, the algorithm is not automatically trying to create a job code or automatically trying to come up with a job code without one being provided. But if you provide a job code, the mapping to that job and that expense happens by machine. So they give us like it's well, the same way that a human would say, okay, if I have a, I'm given a job code, I know to associate uh -huh. these expenses with this job. If, if it, the job codes located on that item or document in a place that we've already confirmed with the client was going to be consistent, then we know to take whatever that number of code, mm -hmm. do a query across the jobs that are in QuickBooks, identify that job that it should be associated with and book it there. So, so we can't see the, I w really wish we could see that right now. Like another example is uh, paper checks. Unfortunately, many clients still write paper checks in this country. And if I write a check, let's say I wrote a check yesterday dated February 28th, right? Yep. And I uh, mailed that check out to my vendor. It's not going to clear until March. You'll, you'll pick it up on the bank feed, but how do yep. you know that it's supposed to be dated in February? So if it, back, back to you know, the machine is not magic. It can only, it can enhance what a person can do if the human had the appropriate data in front of them. But if you cut a check and you don't tell us you cut the check, you don't send us an image of the check, you don't send us an email telling us you cut the check, we're not gonna know to recognize that expense until it hits. And then if it hits, it, even then, we wouldn't know to even query you as to whether or not this should have been booked or accrued in a month prior, the same way that a human bookkeeper wouldn't know to do that either if they saw an expense hit, unless there was some communication with the client that said, hey, every time a check clears, can you ping me and I'll let you know where I want to recognize that in our books. So, and let's just say like, say that didn't clear, like, or say you told us, let's play the other scenario, which would be, uh, say you told us you were cutting a check and this is the amount and we knew the check was being cut. We'd have that booked in the month that you wanted that check or that expense to be recognized. And then in six months, say in six months from now, we'd set a rule set that basically said, we don't see another transaction that matches this dollar amount in within this period of time, follow up with client and say, you know, do you want us to write this check off? Um, do you want us to go another six months and potentially, you know, recognize it if it eventually gets cashed? And so a lot of this comes back down to, the, and this is where like the automation in that example is not even the machine doing anything fancy around how it's like booking or recognizing it. It's the machine staying on top of the human to tell the human when to follow up uh, or check in on something or identify that, hey, this looks like the, that check double check whether or not uh, that even though the dollar amounts match up, is this the same check we're, we're talking about? So uh, if we're not going to see anything else, uh, we can probably stop the screen share, right, David? Okay, great. So, 
So Veronica said something interesting that I'd like to bring up here. She said, bookkeeping is not working the bank feed. That's just data categorization. What else does Botkeeper do that is true bookkeeping? Bank reconciliations, question mark? Well, I, I guess if um, the, the question, this is like an even bigger question, like what is bookkeeping, right? There are, there are plenty of uh, companies out there, you know, that say grab data off of a receipt and, and categorize that for you that call themselves automated bookkeeping. Um, there are cash basis bookkeepers that would call themselves, you know, bookkeeping. Um, are you, are we talking about bookkeeping or are we talking about private accounting? Um, you know, I think, I think this is more of a matter of like terminology, like where do you draw the lines? What, what is bookkeeping? Uh, you know, Botkeeper does automate various aspects of bookkeeping. Our humans fill in the blanks. Um, the end result is your books reconcile, you get the financial statements you want, you see the dashboards and analytics within our platform that tell you how your business is doing and whether it's trending or growing or uh, needs assistance. Um, the source documents all live in our Botkeeper system. Um, so you have that for, you know, if you go through an audit, um, you have an easy way to upload and get information to us. Um, you can connect different data sources to Botkeeper. Uh, we allow yeah. you to integrate third-party apps to each other. I... Yeah, well, and that's, you know, it's clear to me that, you know, based on your user reviews, and you do have many passionate users and accountants who use Botkeeper and are happy with it, that the end product seems to be, in many cases, uh, excellent. But, you. Th you know, that it's obvious, right? And I'm... Uh, Thank you. Good for you guys for doing that. Um, not, you know, there are plenty of terrible bookkeeping firms out there and terrible accounting firms. So, um, the, the Let them get better. Yeah, but my question is really about like like how the uh, sausage is made, right? And I, I think that that's what we really want to know as bookkeepers and accountants is, you know, how much of this is human versus machine, like really clearly, truly, uh, and and. Like, so it's, in my opinion, it's not an easy answer. It's not a, like Botkeeper doesn't make one sausage and sell a million of them. We make a variety of sausages because businesses aren't, no two businesses are exactly alike, right? So it's, it's hard to say that, uh, you know, if you looked at one business and what we were doing for one business um, and the level of automation, I mean, we have a free bookkeeping product, right? So there are businesses that can use Botkeeper entirely for free. And mm -hmm. the only way you can do that, and the economics make sense, and that's forever. That's not like a short-term license. The economics only makes sense to do that if you can fully automate what's being done in that case. Right. So well, so, so let's talk about definitions, right? Because if I, let's say I start up, uh, let's say I go back into, well, I, I have a client still. So uh, I, I do bookkeeping for that client in addition to accounting. And if, let's say all I did was code transactions in the GL, yep. right? And that was the only thing I did for them. And I never reconciled the accounts uh, and I never sent them any reports. Yep. Could I really call myself a bookkeeper? You'd be surprised. There are definitely people out there that do. Um, but, you know, fortunately that's why Botkeeper doesn't just call ourselves a categorizer of transactions. That's why we deliver the full suite of bookkeeping services. Now you could be a business that says, Hey, that's all I want you to do. And I'll do the rest. You could be an accounting firm that has a team that you say, Hey, I want to do the, I want to do the invoicing. Like you don't have to use us to send invoices to your clients. You can do the invoicing yourself. You don't have to use us to pay your bills. You can well, and, and you brought up the invoicing. So that's a question somebody asked is how, who's doing the invoicing. Is it the bots? Is it the algorithm? So if it's, if we're extracting data off of a sales contract, that's predominantly unified or standardized in some way. We can grab that data and turn that into an invoice, but we usually don't send that invoice out to the client. We just put it into QuickBooks and it's up to you to actually do the sending because revenue for a business is probably one of the most sensitive aspects of that business. And so they usually want to put a human eye on it. I'd say we have, you know, maybe it's like 30% of our clients use us to do invoicing. Um, and the rest of them do the invoicing themselves, especially as, you know, the, the complexities of invoicing continue to grow. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so let's try to lay it out for the listeners and the viewers, like what exactly the bots are doing. And, and by bots, I don't mean bots in quotation mark where it's, you know, people 
and we're calling them bots. I'm saying, what is the bot actually doing? And it looks to me like it's a, it's a more sophisticated coding algorithm, right? That's leveraging, it's, lever it's pulling in from OCR technology. It's figuring out what kind of document it is and it's putting that into the subsidiary ledger or the GL, wherever it's, whatever system it's supposed to go into. But after that, that's, that seems to be it. Am I wrong on that? Well, what's your definition of a bot, right? So like AI- is Anything that is fully automated that doesn't require human intervention. So moving data from one system to another would be a bot. Or what, yeah, if, what if- I mean, by a loose definition, take right? Take off the bot. Because a, a bot, most bots that are out there, even like robotic process automation and like large firms, the the kickoff of running the bot has human intervention. Mm -hmm. So, the the and I think this is this is like one of the the challenges, right? That it's an understanding of actually the underlying tech. It's it's an understanding of the term or definition of bot or of AI or of machine learning or of natural language processing or of robotic process automation or of data integration. There are various technologies at play. Botkeeper has built and leverages many of these different tools in a variety of fashions and workflows, and then stitches them together to get as much of the job done for a given client as possible. And then, yes, humans fill in the gap. I mean, mm -hmm. we're very proud of our humans. We have skilled accountants. We have skilled data validation people. We're a global company with a team in three countries, 22 states, and three offices here in the US. And I think we got a lot of diversity that we're happy about there. So uh, speaking of the global nature of your business, that brings me to my second concern or, or question, big question about Botkeeper, right? right? Which is the Philippines office, right? And office also in Nigeria too. So you have an office in Nigeria. Right, okay. Well, that one I couldn't find anything about on Google. Do I have to search Botkeeper Nigeria to find it? No, we actually, we That's just- our engineering team. That's yeah. it's only engineering happens there and it's only a, a part of our engineering team. So there's no actual bookkeeping or accounting going on there. Okay, so got it. So that's, so that's different, right? Um, and because my main, my main concern is uh, about client data, right? I live in California where the California Board of Accountancy requires that CPAs get written authorization and disclose any even potential offshoring of their clients' confidential information. Yep. So, so you'll be very happy to hear that all data sent to Botkeeper rests and stays entirely in the US. That's why if you look at you know our contracts, we talk about all the data processing being here in the US. Well, Just because I, we have a team remotely, they're accessing data that resides and is stored here from a remote okay. destination through our application and through our, our like hardware and tech that doesn't allow them to actually take the data over there. So, so I, I understand that I understand uh, that the data is in AWS servers that are in the United States, but are you really yeah. telling me that when, when the data is then displayed on a computer screen in an office in the Philippines, that that, that, that data is not in the Philippines when that happens? The data is has not been downloaded and has not been sent to the Philippines. It can be, well, but just by being displayed on a computer screen, there's a human being there in the Philippines, you know, or wherever they are in the world that is viewing that information. Right. The internet, by definition, if anything goes from a server to a web browser, a copy of that web page has just been made on that computer. Now you may go to the next page, you may clear your cache, and it goes away, but. That's just the way the internet works, right? It's a copy of a file being put on somebody else's computer and shown on their screen. So the the there's no data uh, that actually will reside on a desktop. There's no way to take screenshots in the Philippines. There's no way to download or store. There's no phones allowed in our office building. There's biometrics that are required to get in. It is a paperless office. USB drives are disabled. There is intensive firewalls and securities and auto 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 logger auto unlogger. So it basically unauthenticates the individual from our systems to repeatedly have them uh, log in and authenticate with new passwords. Um, and data is continuously as it's being viewed, it's being viewed within our applications that are a closed network that's within the botkeeper framework where outside sites are not being able to be accessed. So Yes, they're physically viewing the data there, but 
the bits of that data, like no file is being actually transferred or sent over there that could be extracted off of a computer and walked away with. Now, so, so th this is great to hear, and I'm, I'm really glad to hear that you're taking these security precautions, but- yeah, Security is our number one priority. Right, but why isn't that anywhere on your website? Right, why? So that's my question is that well, nowhere, so nowhere on the BotKeeper website could I find a single mention of offshoring of data or labor and, you know, hey, it doesn't matter if the computer code or the bits and the bytes reside in, you know, the United States. If but it doesn't matter. I well, mean, that's, that's the big issue with offshoring is that if you look at a lot of these, like, you know, there, I'm not no names, but there was a company that was called out for basically sending a lot of data through Mechanical Turk. And that data was physically going to, the, to India uh -huh. where people had that data and had access to it to do but, with what they wanted. They could walk out of that building with data. Right. But so, so I, I understand you're taking these precautions, but like if, if somebody is like information can be transferred in more than just, you know, bits and bytes, right? It can be simply transferred by somebody looking at it on a computer screen. Like the information that you are telling me is being transmitted to me through this Zoom session into, you know, my brain through my eyeballs not, and my ears. Just because I can see you on my screen doesn't mean you're in my office. Right. I know. But I'm the data that you are giving me is coming to me in Los Angeles now, right? It's not staying with you in New York or you Boston. Can, you can have this data because you're recording it and you're downloading it, but- So, so here's my, th so here's the it. thing, the, the accountants that you have in the Philippines, right? Let's say one of them is, uh, has a very good memory, right? And, or one of them has a mnemonic memory or a perfect memory. They now have confidential client information in their brain that I, as a CPA who signed up with you, never, thought that a human being was going to see because, you know, it, in my perception based on your website is that the data what, is all being processed by an algorithm. What confidential client information is seen in that screen you saw Justin showing? So remember, we have U.S. accounting team. Mm -hmm. So the complex accounting tasks, those reside here in the U.S. So our U.S. team here is the one that are performing the complex tasks. We have a data validation team in the Philippines that looks at all the data that's being processed and confirms that the algorithm is doing its job and getting it right. But it's only seeing limited amounts of data. Well, There's what exactly are they seeing? I'm curious about that because like, you know, my seeing, understanding is that a human being has to do the bank reconciliation, for example, that, that you're, you're, you know, the bots don't do that. Yep. Right. And the, so here in the US pushes the button and confirms that reconciliation. So, so does the Philippines, team have access into QuickBooks Online files? Like, can they, can they log in as a user and, and manipulate data? They can log in through our application. Right. Can they see, like if the, you know, you open your sandbox QBO file, right? Can they go into my client's QBO file? Uh, I'm, I'll have to double check with, because it can't be that the only thing they're doing is just how, how, I mean, if they're in your application, the one that processes the bank feed, and then they click OK, I mean, how, what if they have a question? What if they are not sure if something should be coded right? They'd have to go into the GL and like look at the data, the history to make it. Or they ping our US team and they ask our US team to look into it and double check it. Uh -huh. Which one of the, like the one of the things that they can do is they can say, hey, can you run this down? Can you check in with the client? So, so what exactly is being done in the Philippines then? Because I guess I'm not clear on that. Data validation. Right, but what's, data. what sort of, like only data validation? And data in, validation. in what applications? So like think about, um, I mean, there are uh, plenty of tools, uh, whether it's a, your general ledger, mm -hmm. whether it's an expense report tracker, whether it's an OCR tool, all of these tools leverage offshore teams to validate and confirm the accuracy of the data that's being submitted and to train up or train down that machine. So we have a, we have a data validation team in the Philippines, which our investors you know, came out, audited uh, along when they're auditing our tech to see, okay, what's this operation look like? How well have you guys securitized it? How well are you? So, sorry, sorry. So I just, I just wanna make sure I'm clear. So like a bank statement, right? In order to reconcile the books, you need to look at the bank statement. Yep. And you need to compare that Looks to QuickBooks. Like okay, so I mean, what other do the, does the does the team in the Philippines have access to source documents? They have to, uh, right, to do the data validation. 
No, remember you the the you watch the algorithm do its thing and contextually look and scrape across the internet to grab the information that it needed in order to uh -huh. do that categorization categorization and classification. And then they're looking at it to affirm that this makes sense. Right. So so let's say uh, a bill comes in, an invoice comes in, or a sales order comes in, right? Some is somebody in the Philippines looking at that, like let's say you're they're validating the data, right? They they're gonna look at what you guys pulled from it and how you're algorithm decided to code it and then they're going to compare it to the actual sales order right to make and the invoice sets, and limited view what? sets like through our application and our us team if it's this is back to like the point you can pretty much assume that if it's a simple task which the simple tasks are usually dealing with a limited set of data or a data set that is more call it ambiguous or is not containing pii yeah those that data is then being affirmed or confirmed by the uh, team in the Philippines. I'm, I'm that, just, so Heather had a great question. Heather Smith said, how can you do data validation without knowing the chart of accounts and past entries? How can you, how can you possibly decide whether or not it's coded correctly if you don't have access to the client file? Because what, what we're looking for is anomalies, right? Like we're looking for right. things that yeah, exactly. totally weird or out of place. So right. see Google and for whatever reason, our system said lease a real estate expense. Uh -huh. So you'd say, no, that doesn't make any sense. Like this, this can't be right. Chase this down, figure out what happened. Now that goes back off to a human. It's one of the reasons why we have a, a, a team of 20 something uh, human accountants in the US who are assisting with these more complicated chasing down tasks. They deal with the, hey, like it, the machine didn't get it right, figure out why and follow up with the client to affirm or deny right. the accuracy of the system. So I'm sorry, I'm, maybe I'm just an idiot, but I'm just not clear on what they have access to. Like if people in the Philippines have access into QuickBooks Online files of clients and I'm a CPA using your service, I want to know that. Okay. Right? Do you think I have a right to know that? I think if you asked or you know, had the question said, hey, like, what, what is the team in the Philippines doing? Is our data going over the Philippines? Now, these are all questions that we are more than happy to answer or walk you through. And we're happy to walk you through too. Like if you're asking the question uh, as a, an interested party or an interested client, walk you through all the security protocols, walk you through how it's data and systems and information works. The downside is what we can't do. And, and one of the things you were bringing up before was if we publish on our site, all the security protocols, everything, how we do what we do, it's basically like publishing how we defend the castle. Now we're making it that much easier for the people who want to get in the castle to try to figure out the ways that they're going to get in. Well, you don't have to give away all your secrets, but I mean, plenty of companies go through security audits. They do, but they also, plenty of companies Did, don't. Publish those have security. you gone through a security audit in your, your Philippines office? We're going through a SOC audit this year. Okay. So you have not yet. Yep. So, so. I'm just kind of flabbergasted that a, a number of CPAs have reached out to me and said that they didn't know that you had an offshore operation. I mean, how can that, how can that be ethical or like, how do you, think, how do you, how do you explain that? So I think it really just boils down to Botkeeper is a global company. We have clients globally. We have employees globally. We have hired, like, we're very proud of our diverse workforce uh -huh. because we like you can hire really, really smart people outside the U.S. They don't have to reside here in the U.S. Um, and because we're a tech first company, we don't, we're not a public accountancy. We don't do taxes. We're not regulated by the, the federal government to have to publish the location of every one of our employees. And you think about it, like when you buy software that uses um, a human element to affirm AI, because AI is an assisted process right now. There's very little AI, I would say, out there that's fully, fully autonomous. And you know, these are thinking like the driving car, right? right. Um, you, if you buy a Microsoft license for Microsoft 360, there's probably a level of AI to that license. It's you know, stored in the cloud, it's coming down to you. That Microsoft sales rep doesn't say, before you purchase this license, let me talk about all the countries in which we have employees and where they reside. You buy, you know- Right, but because those employees uh, you know, aren't data. supposed I mean, to be looking at my client data. They, they are. I mean, David Leary represents a company that does this exact thing. They're looking at your data, but you, you, it's not a, they're looking at your data to affirm that data, uh, accuracy and integrity, but they're not, 
the, the data, so long as the data is not actually being physically present in that country or being able to be downloaded, you're having the same security and the same governance of law that you have here in the US. Like we're governed under the same US legal regulations around security of data that any US company would be. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I just, if it's not a big deal, then why don't you disclose this on your website? We, we didn't realize, we didn't realize it was a big deal. We, we like many, like I said, many tech companies. So AI is a new thing that's emerging into the accounting practice. I think if you looked at industries in general, most tech companies that have global teams, they don't paste the location of those teams on the front page of their site. You know, plenty, there's actually like companies that are to fully endorsed by, you know, the AI CPA. I think Ernest pointed this out, you know, one in particular is endorsed by the ASCPA and they have offshore teams doing validation. They actually even send data oh. offshore. So we, we're not we're not saying, I'm not saying that like we are anti against disclosing this info. We just didn't realize the accounting industry like was so concerned about this. So we're working, like we have marketing actually already working on, you know, launching an updated version of our site that's gonna disclose where we have offices, where we have people, We'll even include, you know, I think probably in our sales process now, a component of that that will talk through further data security. I mean, we, what we really need is like the help of the accounting industry to help educate us on how can we support and benefit you better? Like we need the industry's experts to say, hey, you know, you guys aren't doing this like, like you, you have, we want you to do this and that's great. Like we're going <laughs> to learn from it and we're going to we're try to become better. Well, and I think it's uh, in your communications, it's obvious like there's been a shift a little bit, right? And you're communicating this out and you've gotten better about it. I, I think if, if I'm understanding your history correctly, you were working in the outsourced bookkeeping space before you started Bothman Group, before it was a tech company, right? Was that when you're working in that space, did like disclosures like this ever come up or like were, was there any awareness of this before or is this like until the, it started popping up in the last three weeks, four weeks, like? It was just never a topic. I mean, no, I mean, we're, we're, it's like, for instance, like we, we don't hide our Philippine office. We, mm -hmm. there's a Facebook page about them. I mean, like, think about it. If we were really trying to mask or disguise the fact that we have a global team, we wouldn't be posting on Facebook photos of yeah. being, you know, in our global team. We wouldn't be doing press releases about the launch or opening of an office there. We well, wait, wait, wait. Let's be clear here. The only do. thing that I was ever able to find about the Philippines operation was a Facebook page that is, the title is Botkeeper PH, so it's not even written out, and a single tweet from January of 2018 with saying that you opened the Philippines office. That was that was it. Google, no Google Botkeeper, well, because you're, you're Googling Botkeeper, uh, maybe Philippine, I don't know what Google, I honestly don't know what Google results you Google, but if you mm -hmm. Google Botkeeper Belanga or Botkeeper Invest in Belanga. There are news articles about us opening an office there. I mean, we're proud of it. We love our team in the Philippines. They're brilliant people. They're so hard work. You party. I saw you, 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 an awards dinner for them. Yeah, just... yeah, we had it. Like we're, we're, we're not. Like I said, we're not. We're not trying to hide this. Like you, you wouldn't publish or post those things. We were publishing and posting those well before this all came up. If we were really trying to hide it, we wouldn't put it online. We wouldn't have a Facebook page for Philippines. We wouldn't allow. We wouldn't have Philippine employees on LinkedIn, you know, being associated with Botkeeper. I mean, we we never we never tried to hide it. It's well, just we realized the accounting industry cared so much about mm -hmm. the location of our employees. Well, I would say there's a there's a difference between trying to hide something and not disclosing something, right? And being upfront about it. And I would like to call out a, a comment from Megan who said, quote, you didn't realize people would care that the bots are actually people. Like well, I one. care. This goes back to like what? What are you calling bots? Like you're, you, uh, what, you're, the bots. Well, it are seems like your definitions, like, your definitions the, are very fluid, right? The definition of what's a bot versus a human, you know, what's I, a uh, what's bookkeeping even? What's the definition yeah. of bookkeeping? What? How do you define it? I mean, I don't know. So David Lear, you you represent a business um, where on their site they say automated bookkeeping, and they extract data off of a receipt and they categorize and classify that. Now, is that, I, then here, like David, you're an expert. So, I mean, and I'm, so I am gonna be really a poor example on this. And the reason why is like, I've always, like 
my career, I've always used the word bookkeeper, CPA, accountant, kind of all interchangeably. And I know that pisses off CPAs because they're like, no, that's a bookkeeper. And then, and people can get very defensive about this, right? But I think in general, a lot of times people think of bookkeeping as kind of the logging and then maybe the reconciliation, right? Like you're definitely not doing tax, right? Like that's, no, but it's the getting it logged it. or getting, getting data shoved into the um, accounting system, right? And however that is, if it's manually typed, if it's done yeah. through some automation, if it's done through a photograph, like getting that data in and then probably a reconciliation, but then maybe not much past that. I mean, obviously, like people are like talking, oh, you got to be an advisor and all this other stuff now. But I think that in people in the chat actually can either say Leary's completely off or close or what. But I, I, this is why I'm saying, like, I don't think like uh, we're, we're making as if like bot keepers. Like, I mean, one, granted, yes, we, we're treading new territory by immersing AI into the accounting industry. This is something that like, you know, AI's entered other industries first. And now it's coming to the accounting industry. But I think like we, when you enter an industry, you follow suit with the other tech companies in the industry. And like, to your point, like you just said, there are, there are companies that do a piece of the bookkeeping equation that refer to that as bookkeeping. And, and we're saying, you know, botkeeper because botkeeper doesn't fully automate every aspect of bookkeeping that we can't say that we have bots, but we do, and we, we have machine learning, we have AI, we have natural language processing, we have robotic process automation, we have workflows, decision trees, OCR, and all of those tools are tech that automates tasks. You can call any cluster of them a bot because it's performing some of the action. But I mean, <clears throat> and, and these, this company, for instance, you're comp like, I'm not to single you out, David, but like, yeah. you're here on this discussion with me, that company that you represent, they don't post on their site front bold letters. They don't have, I don't even know if they have a Facebook page for their offshore labor. Like, I mean, but, I mean, every webinar I do, it's, it's, Hey, there's human verification that also takes place. Right. There, there's, it, it, it's, no, it, I, we've always said it. Right. Um, you I, 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 on the same page here. Yeah. I totally agree. And I, I just don't like, you know, I, why, why, why is it being made like such a, a crazy point that because if you go to our website, we say humans, we say a, a bot keeper is a combination of skilled human accountants plus machine learning and AI. And we publish that in most of the articles we publish. We, we don't ever claim that this. And I, and I think there's something like you kind of talked about on the phone. Like everybody misses that part, right? But, well, but wait, hold on, David. Hold on, hold on. I would like to read one of Enrico's public statements and ask Enrico to clarify this. This is yep. I highlighted this on my post. The easiest way to think of bot keeper is as a robot bookkeeper. It replaces the need for a full-time bookkeeper in your company. It will pay your bills, invoice your clients, reconcile your bank accounts, produce your financial reports, classify expenses and revenue, administer bill pay workflows and payroll, and do any calculations needed for this. It can be the last bookkeeper you'll ever need to hire and very quickly become your entire accounting department. Since creating the botkeeper, we've never had to hire a bookkeeper. But you've got, who are the people in the Philippines? What are they uh -huh. doing when they validate those transactions? I mean, we isn't that saying, isn't that bookkeeping? We weren't saying since since we created Botkeeper, we haven't had to hire a bookkeeper. We were saying that Botkeeper as a thing, as a company, is a substitute for a bookkeeper. So where you would normally have a human bookkeeper in your office doing bookkeeping for your business, you could instead not have that person sitting next to you, sign a contract with Botkeeper to do that work, and you wouldn't need that person here. And that it is a robot bookkeeper, a cyborg, however you want to define it. Like I'm, we're, what we're trying to do in this, I mean, anytime you try to convey uh, a new technology, a new system that leverages various aspects of technology and is com complex. Like I gave the background of what's actually happening when Justin ran that thing. More often times a company communicates not, like communicating all the complexities and diving deep on the tech isn't going to do anyone good. It's like trying to describe, you know, how all the nuances to what makes a phone operate. What you care about is that you can take photos on it. It has an alarm clock. You can make calls. You know, a phone has evolved so much since it began, you know, seven years ago or since, you know, the first, say, uh, uh, more modern well, self. Yeah, but, but part of the reason I use an iPhone 
is because I have guarantees from Apple that my data stays on my iPhone and that it doesn't go overseas, Enrico. <laughs> but what about people who use Androids? That's why I don't use one because I can't trust it. All right. So, I mean, I'm just, I'm kind of flabbergasted at like the, can you, can you not um, see how an outsider who doesn't know anything about bookkeeping. But you're, wait, you, you're, are you on Facebook? What's that? Aren't you on Facebook? <laughs> Oh yeah, so I know. You want, I don't you want to say you use technology that guarantees your data doesn't can't get hacked into and get out. You use technology every day. You oh, use... I know. And Facebook, That's... Facebook is terrible, and it's awful that you know we have to use it to get to well, cross people. To it, but you use it. So the argument that you only use Apple because it only does this is you, you use tools all the time that don't. And, and who's to so, prevent Apple from getting? Yeah, hacked? and we should. And here's the thing: is that's why there's been all this reporting on Facebook, right? We should know where what is happening with our data and where it's going. And that was, you know, the intent. I think of the. Well, I don't think that was my intent in all of this. Is not to, you know, you know, they build iPhones overseas, right? Right. And and guess what? Here's here's an. Let's say let's say Apple made those iPhones and they said they were built in the U.S., but really they're built in China. I think we would all, you know, that wouldn't be fair. Would we, it? we never claimed we bought Keeper as a U.S. only yeah. company. We're a global company with global clients. I mean, I, no, where does it? So in your terms of service on your website, it says that all the data is processed in the United States. Did you know that? Refers to computing and all the data sits and lives on U.S. servers. By I think federally by, regulated, like our, our legal team had, like we went through uh -huh. an extensive process in terms of like how we decided to, uh, build our servers and actually quite frankly like managing servers that were in the US versus managing overseas is just easier but we, we went through like extensive uh, legal review on how we did these contracts to confirm and basically use the same terminology that um, most tech companies use if the data is living on servers here is validating not a form of processing I mean you and this comes back to like David saying well is a, is a bookkeeper an accountant a CPA I mean it, it's it, you, we're, we're getting into semantic. Yeah. I understand. I, don't get me wrong. I totally understand the point here. We we want to get better. Like I I want to help get better. I need the help of the accounting industry. I mean, you you bringing this to light is real. Like we didn't realize this was a problem. People, our partners, clients weren't coming to us and saying, "Hey, you know, we found out you had a PH office. This is really frustrating." We we didn't real like because they already are using like most accountants, especially cloud accountants, you're already using technology that has offshore offices and that is in one instance actually sending truly sending the data overseas. Our offices are actually our offices. Like we don't I, throw it a mechanical Turk or something. I, I think the part that like really if I look back the last 12 months or so, right? Because you made the big splash at, at all of the accounting conferences, right? You're you're getting a you're 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 doing uh, talks on stage, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, A, the name is genius, right? Like you have, it's, it's a perfect name, right? You have good marketing. The, it almost looks like a little bit, I think the confusion is, and this is even for me, because I had people would ask me like, hey, they're an app, are they an app? What, what is, everybody asked me about the apps in our space. And then I finally figured out like, no, there's an accounting firm with tech, right? Or a bookkeeping firm with tech. And as soon as you, as soon as you comprehend that, you think about what you're doing differently, but, Outside of that, like I came up with that conclusion. I don't think that's the average conclusion people come up with because I mean, really it's always like the magic bots or, I mean, I think even Jody Pinard's like, oh, it's Enrico's magic brain. You put them in the bots and it does everything magically. The bots are doing my whole company now. And like, it's, you came off really, you've come off as being this miracle technology and you're really a bookkeeping firm that has some serious cool tech and is super highly efficient but you've just never came off as like this super crazy efficient bookkeeping firm with a suite of services, like you kind of said in the very beginning of this call. Yeah. I think that's because like what we wanted when we're, like you said, we're very different from a traditional cloud accounting firm or from a traditional bookkeeping firm. So when you're, when you're doing your marketing, you market the differences, right? Like what makes Botkeeper different from another clouding firm? Well, we've got 30 engineers who have built some really cool tech to allow us to do more with less resources. And not just do more, but make it more accurate, um, give you more reporting, more analytics, do it faster. So those are the things, like when we do a lot of our messaging, it's, you know, yes, we provide bookkeeping as a service, but 
what, what, why would you use us over someone else? Well, because of here's the tech that we've built and deployed. And that's what but, makes us. So having come from a firm, uh, I came from Armanino, top 25 accounting firm before I joined uh, my current company. And, you know, we were competing against guys like you, Enrico. Uh, we were only using accountants in the United States. And it was very expensive, as you know, to yep. do bookkeeping in that manner. But it was a selling point for us. We could say that your data is in the U.S. and it's being processed by Armanino employees in the United States. And so, you know, I mean, I don't have to compete against you anymore, which is kind of nice, you know, because it was difficult. I hope you but, wouldn't be competing. We'd rather yeah. be working with you. Like, well, not, you know, other, there, there are other similar other similar services, I should say, right? So, but what, what was unfair about it, what struck me as very unfair, and I think other folks in the chat will agree is unfair, is that like, you've got this amazing marketing where it says that it's all automated and it's bots and it's not talking about the humans, it's not talking about the Philippines, and it puts them at a disadvantage. How do you respond to that? Like, have you, have you seen like the first page of our site? Just read what the definition of botkeeper is. What is botkeeper? You say it's a combination of uh, artificial intelligence and humans. Yeah. Oh, it's humans first. We actually even like in the way that we describe it, we right. say skilled human accountants. Right. AI. Yeah. But you don't, you don't talk about, and, and this is where I get to, because I said there's two points here and we shouldn't get confused between them. There's the fact of human versus machine, which is less important to me than the failure to disclose offshoring. And there's a lot of people in this country right now who I, are concerned about job losses due to automation. And I mean, it, it's kind of like you're taking US bookkeeping jobs and you're shipping them overseas under the guise of AI. Oh, come on. That's... That's really harsh. I mean, we, we employ, like, I want to say Botkeeper probably employs about 100 people now. We've hired 30 people here in the U.S. Uh, in, like, the last 30 days. I mean, we're, we're hiring a lot of brilliant people. And I think, like, I mean, my understanding of the accounting market, at any time I've done these talks, I said, what are the biggest challenges everyone's facing? And it's they can't find good bookkeepers. So I don't think it's like a, I, I think Botkeeper, if anything, is helping augment this lack of supply like hiring, maintaining, you even told it to me yourself. You said, look, I would not be able to hire. I could not, the reason I got out of my business, is it was not a, like, was not going to be profitable and scalable for me to try to find another bookkeeper like I had. I just wasn't going to be able to repeat that. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason that that's the case is because there's not enough of them. Like there's, there's almost more accounting firms from the baby boomer generation than there are new accountants entering the industry to take them over. So we're, I think we're, we're trying to help bridge a gap. We're certainly not trying to like cause job disruption. I mean, there are a lot of people that are employed by Botkeeper that have built lives and families with Botkeeper. You know, we, we, we take care of our staff, we give them, you know, uh, benefits. I mean, we're not like, you know, please don't make us out to be this like evil company trying to put everyone out of jobs because, you know, you could, it, then why isn't, why isn't the platforms that we use every day to do the accounting in an evil company that's putting us out of jobs because they have, you know, a thousand people in India and people yeah, over in other yeah, countries. But, but people digging holes with shovels. Uh, you can't. Yeah, I mean, come on, man. Like, this is like mountain out of a molehill. Like, yeah. Well, so the thing, the thing that I would, um, again, I keep coming back to is simply disclosure. And I'm really, really happy to hear that you guys are going to be more upfront about this in the future. That that yeah, satisfies like, and and you know i wish you all i really do i i wish your company success right um and i i hope that you achieve greatness and really do build a tool that can automate a lot of this you know manual work the the thing to me that's been disappointing has been the appearance of we've built this magical thing when in fact you haven't. And I know that's a big tech thing that it's very common in the tech world to, you know, prop yourself up with really clever marketing and- oh, wait, so you just said we, we, built, we built a magical thing when we didn't, but we just, the, we started this whole thing with doing a demo where if there were yeah. thousands of transactions being processed, it would normally take a person a lot of time to do even just that one piece of the equation. And Botkeeper has magic that, does it right and like it's not actually magic obviously it's a combination of technologies yeah. that we've built but we're we're touting the tech that we've built because we're very proud of it and we have people who put a lot of time all-nighters into 
doing it. We should be excited and proud of it. Well, yeah, but well, again, Enrico, don't don't pat yourself on the back too much, because <laughs> uh, Amanda Aguilard said, I don't know if it was in this thread or on Twitter. She said, like, hey, I can automate ninety percent of the bookkeeping just with so setting up some bank rolls. And you and know, Blake, I mean, I I know, like, yes, there there's a combination of humans and accounts. So I started back at Botkeeper in, in November 2017. So I know every part of the Botkeeper system. I built most of it. I live, uh, you can ask anyone at Botkeeper. I sleep about eight hours a week. And that's because I care so strongly about our clients that they use our software that like you can ask most of our clients. Some of them email me directly at 2, 3 a.m. and I respond back to them. And like we make sure. So, you know, when you say like, hey, you guys just made a bunch of magic, you know, we have 30 engineers who, like give up their weekends, give up. I mean, even our Philippines office, you know, because we have engineers over there. They, some of them can use five hours a day to, to come work. And like, so to kind of just say like, hey, we're not building anything. Like that's a pretty big, like, you know, backhanded compliment to like all the work we've done here. So I just kind of want, you know, everything here. Like, I would just appreciate that you could be a little bit nicer here. I'm sorry, because, Justin. Like, I'm, I'm really sorry. You know, I, I mean, you and the engineers, no disrespect. I just from an outsider's perspective, we came here to see a demo. And so far, the only thing I've actually seen is you guys, you know, code some transactions from a bank feed. So well, I'm just saying, where is it? You know, what, show me the bots. We, if, if we, if we were, if we were selling something, if we were like creating a hyperbole on what we built and we, we've all seen what happens when that, like, like when a startup way oversells what it's actually done, and someone buys it and they realize it can't do or deliver the thing I bought it for, they leave or they leave bad reviews. You started the conversation out with being like, That's true. I mean, you must have done something pretty special because you've got you've got clients that love you, you have partners that love you, you you guys have built and we're not we've never claimed that like that we're we're like I said, a cyborg. Like this thing is creating better bookkeeping it is not like if, if there were no human we wouldn't have a team of people like it, it, the goal is to make better bookkeeping to do it more efficiently to allow i mean i think the thing that like is scarier about the industry is the fact that you know some of these for platforms that we all leverage to do accounting in are potentially going to be doing bookkeeping and we're we built a platform that allows our partners to offer, still offer bookkeeping services at very competitive rates, make some really nice margin on them and get a better result than they would if they were trying to hire and manage a team. And that's because like, it's that combination of tech and, and human. And, and even just how that, that there's an intricacy there, like yeah. how the tech interacts with the human, how the human leverages the tech, like that's not easy to do. I think we've done a really, really good job at it. And that, that's why we've got a lot of people that love our product. That's great. And I give you all the credit for that. And I think, uh, like, to kind of wrap this up, probably we should get toward the end, right, David? Yeah, <laughs> we should I'm try sure to wrap this up. Enrico's right? got incredible stamina. I have to yeah. say, Enrico, uh, your public speaking ability is is incredible, <laughs> and your ability to answer every question is just amazing. I don't think I could do it. Um, so thank you for giving us all this time. Uh, I, I guess the way I would summarize this is sort of like we've almost got a culture clash here. No, we do have a culture clash here. It's the tech culture and the accountant culture. Right, and it's clear to me that um, in the tech world, which I am now a part of as a CPA and learning all about, it's clear to me that there is this, you know, uh, mentality of of like let's just make it work, let's make it happen, and let's get it done, and it, we're not going to think too much about how we do it. And in the accounting world, we think a lot about how we do it and the ethics of how we do it and how we disclose it and how we talk about it to our clients. So, you know, it's not enough for me if I'm a if I'm a CFO or a controller to go and print a bunch of financial statements and say that's it, doesn't matter how that happened, doesn't matter how those numbers got put together, the numbers are good, right? No, how they get put together matters. And so I would just say to anyone who's watching this um, in the in the tech space, it's really important I think to think about how you are doing it and how you are disclosing it and whether or not you are being, you know, fully upfront and transparent about it. So I think I, I agree with you. I think this is a, it's a two different cultures, technology entering a different industry. And we need to, it, 
it, it, the, to solve this and to like make it work, it can't be one-sided. We need the accounting industry to ask the questions that they care about. So if, if do, you have, do you have a team overseas doing anything is an important question, then they should be asking it of every technology company that they want to leverage. And the same way that like we're learning that the accounting industry cares about those things. So yeah. let's start being proactive in you know, up disclosing them. Yeah, both are coming. Oh, and you know who I think we can all you know like, we... yeah, let's help each other make this industry better. And you know who we can all uh, hate on right now is the um, the media, because I think that they kind of failed here in, in that they didn't ask you any questions. Well, the, the thing, I mean, <laughs> you, it, the, the challenge with the media too is media writes content about their interpretation of something, right? So like Botkeeper emerges, someone reads about Botkeeper, writes their opinions about what Botkeeper is or how it works or like how it acts and then publishes it as if it's totally fact. And then like to this point, there's a publication out there. Like I remember when it came out that said Botkeeper is a chat bot for accounting. And I yeah, died. Tech, tech crunch wrote that. That was the first time I had heard that. I was like, okay, this, you think we're a chat, we're not a chat bot. We don't even have chat bots internally at that time. We, we leverage some chat bots now, but yeah, I mean it, it, and, but the problem is they published that as if it was fact and never did this, like what you and I are now doing here, where it's this, like, you're asking me the detailed question. I'm giving you a detailed answer all too often. The media to your point does shoots from the hip first and then ask questions later. And I think they need to do a lot more of this where like you can ask questions, they can answer them, then they can actually document the fact. But there's a lot of, you know, I mean, there's an issue out there with like fake news and with every snowstorm these days is a snow again, right? Like it's, it's all being blown out of proportion. And you know, I'm looking forward to, you know, like I said, accountants and tech companies working together um, and you know, I think just like we're trying to make the industry better. We want to work with you. Help us. Yeah. Right. So I think we should start wrapping this up. So if you don't want to just go on into people's happy hours now, right on a Friday night. Um, thank you for joining us, Enrico. Uh, did you have one more thing, Blake? I saw no, you, no, I'm. That you're ready to dig in again. <laughs> no, no, I was giving you a thumbs up, David. Okay. I, I honestly think, like, from a uh, a perspective of things just haven't been clear. And just by taking the time to get a forum like this and the people who've, obviously people felt it was important. I think um, 40 people or so attended to learn more about this. And now there's a place for people to go to like, who want to learn more about Botkeeper can go to this video and learn more, right? And I think it's very balanced that, that kind of came out of this. And uh, thank you for coming, Justin. Thank you for doing the demo you did. Um, all right, Blake, I think that's it. Do you want to wrap up and uh, that's it. call it? All right, I think we'll, we'll kill it. All right, bye everybody. Bye. Take care. Thanks. Bye.